I think absolutely there's um, a lot of debate around this. I think the new um, uh, development of assessments that really begin to look at um, the kind of skills that a student needs to be college ready in, in secondary uh, secondary school environment um, are, are are not there yet. Um, and you know we're trying to develop and work through proxies, but um, the, the state tests that exist, um, the uh, that were really designed in the context of No Child Left Behind, don't necessarily measure those particular skills. Um, I think the the Common Core movement um, is a is a great hope towards essentially moving the bar on what the it is that we should be measuring. And I think we're several years away from having any clarity around what that new um, generation of assessments for students is going to look like. I, I might even ask uh, Lynn to comment on this because even in healthcare, some of the bitterest battles around research in healthcare is around outcomes. Mm -hmm. Is it how long you live or how well you live? And, uh, you know, for better or worse, our technologies can drive you in either direction, but not always in both. So even in the healthcare world, although there's been, you know, huge progress, obviously, in a lot of very simple things that go together, I think there's some of the same issues around outcomes. It's just in education, absolutely, the wars about skills and how to define them and what is good writing? I mean, you could start a, start a fire over that in any room of, you know, adults. No problem. And this is where the challenge is. At some stage, just like in, you know, the big research communities in healthcare, you got to end up narrowing down and trying to pick one or a couple of things. The, the plethora of standards and assessment schemes and all that um, now do make it really confusing when you're trying to really learn at scale. Um, so so I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but it's similar in some ways. Oh, very much, and it's very much the heart of the major initiatives that are going now with comparative effectiveness research. Almost every diagnosis, there are several or five or ten different treatments that are out there. And we're probably not going to come down in, in many cases to say A or B, a clear choice. Every patient should have A or every patient should have B. You're actually going to have a probability distributions. And for informed decision making, you, the doctor should be able to sit down with the patient, with the patient ultimately making the decision, and saying, "Look, here's the risks and the the, the benefits and the risks of these uh, three treatments for breast cancer." We already have an adjuvant online is a very good system already to do that on the desktop. Um, but that's in, what you'll get with informed decision making and with data. You're not going to get a single value, or seldom will you get a single value. You'll be able to say, here's all the data. This is the real world. Here's how the real world works. And here's how, uh, you, if you need to make a choice, uh, here's the experience, all the ev evidence we have from the experimental data and from observational data of patients like you. Um, and, uh, you know, what do you value? And in many of these cases in health in healthcare, it's, you know, a quality, their quality of life issues. There's uh, side effects issues, uh, and they aren't known with certainty. But the best we can do, as long as that's the real world, uh, we can at least inform everyone that there are major differences uh, on many of these dimensions for different treatments and allow people to make an informed choice. So um, I think that's the, the kind of thing you can do with data. You can just tell people what the real world is and um, help them make uh, better decisions.